Good morning, and thank you all so much for being here. My name is Kim Bryan. I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer here at the museum. On behalf of the museum, I want to welcome you all, and thank you so much for being here today. In November 1963, Buell worked here in this very building as an employee of the Texas School Book Depository. I'll leave it to Buell and our wonderful museum curator, Stephen Fagan, to get into the fascinating details of Buell's story. But on behalf of the museum, we are honored to have Buell with us here today. Buell's, yes. <laughs> Buell's book, Steering Truth, was published earlier this year and there are signed copies available in the museum store on the first floor. So we encourage you all to, to stop by the, the store on your way out. If you have questions of your own, we have left question cards on all the chairs. So you can write your question and museum staff will come along towards the end of the program to collect them and we'll pass them along to Stephen and Buell. At the close of the program at 12.30 after the Q&A, we will observe a moment of silence to mark the moment of the assassination of President Kennedy 58 years ago. With that, I'll turn it over to Stephen and Buell. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to uh, have such a great group here to uh, join us to commemorate the 58th anniversary of the assassination. And there's no better person really to share the stage with than someone who was here working in this building more than half a century ago when all of these historic events unfolded. Buell, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing your memories with us. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you out there in the audience. I'd like to say I hope the time that you have uh, taken this morning when we're through with this program, I hope that you uh, feel like the time that you spent here, it was worth your time. I don't think there'll be a question of that, really. When, when you got here a little while ago, we took a look at this installation called Fragments, and it was the first time you got to see some of these architectural elements from the building since you worked here 58 years ago. That is true. Uh, in fact, that customer service wholesale sign, you, you actually helped us identify where that was in the building on the uh, ground floor by the will call desk, right? Yes. And uh, you got to see the sign from out front of the building and the breeze blocks and the hurt sign. The closest you've ever gotten to the hurt sign was today because you never went up on the roof when you were working here in the building, right? That is correct. Because yeah. when they would come to service the, uh, the sign, they used to go up to take them up to the seventh floor. But I wasn't permitted to go up on the roof. I just took the guys up to work on the, uh, to do the maintenance on the sign. Mm. Well, it's great that you're able to be here and we have so many historic elements of the building surrounding us today. So here we are, the Texas School Book Depository. Buell, you came to work here in September of 1963. That is correct. And it was um, about a month later that uh, a young man named Lee Harvey Oswald joined the staff. Before we talk about Oswald's employment here and training Oswald, Buell, for those who really are not familiar with uh, how this building functioned and what the different floors did. Just give us a, a brief overview of what your job as an order filler was at the Texas School Book Depository. Okay, my, uh, my employment with the Texas School Book Depository was, like uh, he said, an order filler. And for some of you who may not know, this, uh, this building has seven floors and a basement. Uh, I was one of the few that could go from the basement to the seventh floor and fill an order. Uh, we had order fillers, other order fillers, but they more specialized in just uh, a few uh, publications that we carried. Uh, okay, excellent. And the man on the screen here, Lee Oswald. Really, Oswald got the job here because of you, because of uh, your sister and, and uh, your sister telling Ruth Payne. Give us a little overview of how Oswald ended up getting the job here really because of, of your employment a month earlier. Okay, the way that happened was that the neighborhood we lived in out in Irving, uh, some of the ladies would get together one or two times a week and they would talk about what was going on in their families. Well, at uh, one of these uh, meetings where they'd have uh, coffee, tea, or some type of pastry items, uh, Miss Ruth Payne, she uh, introduced Marina Oswald to the ladies there that day, and she told them that uh, Lee was uh, looking for work. And so my sister, she says, well, she said, my brother recently went to, uh, has gone to work uh, and is employed by a company in Dallas. 
And she said that he works a lot of overtime. So Ms. Payne asked, well, will you check and see if they're uh, still taking applications? Well, that afternoon when I came home from work, my sister asked me, she said, are they still taking applications down where you're employed? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll have to ask. Well, the next morning, uh, I, when I had gone into uh, work, I ran into my supervisor, Mr. Uh, Shelley, and I asked him, I said, Mr. Shelley, I said, are we still taking applications for employment? And he said, well, let me check and see. Well, he checked with Mr. Truly, and uh, Mr. Truly told him yes. And so uh, that afternoon when I got home, I told my sister, I said, well, you can tell Miss Payne that uh, we are still taking applications. Uh, and so from that, uh, Lee, uh, he came to the Texas School Book Depository and he applied for uh, work and he was hired by Mr. Truly. And the first time that I ever had the opportunity to meet Lee was that morning that he came to work. Uh, matter of fact, I was up on uh, one of the floors uh, filling an order and we had a uh, speaker system on all the floors. And Mr. Shelley asked me, he said, will you come to my office? Well, I said, yes, sir, be right there. So I stopped filling the order, laid my clipboard down, put the pencil in my pocket, went down the elevator, and I went over to his office on the first floor. And there was a young man sitting there with him. And so Mr. Shelley says, uh, and, that, and that time I went by the name of Wesley, my middle name. He said, Wesley, he said, uh, uh, Lee is going to be working with us. And I said, well, glad. Good, glad to have you. And he says, well, here's what I need for you to do. He said, I need you to take him and teach him to fill orders as well as you. And I said, well, Mr. Shelley, I'll do my best. And for the next three or four days, uh, Lee was just like my shadow. Uh, I will tell you this, Lee was a fast learner. He's very smart. I know you don't read that, but I can tell you he was very smart because he didn't ask you the same question every day over and over. And the thing I like to point about this building was that if someone goes to work in a distribution center today, when you get a printout, it tells you what location you are to pull from. The order, only thing they tell you is how many copies that the customer was requesting. So you had to figure out how many cases of books you need. If you need loose ones, you got them down from the first floor, they're in the bins. Mm -hmm. And the full cases were stored on the uh, different uh, Floors. Yeah. How did Lee fit in with the other guys that worked here? Um, Lee tried very hard, but he didn't fit in very well. Uh, the guys would make fun of him and give you an example. If, if he and someone was out on the dock and they witnessed something happen out in, on Houston Street, uh, and if you were to hear the two individuals talking about the same incident, you would not think they were. And by that, I'm uh, referring to the, the words that Lee used to describe what he had seen. And then the other individual telling his version of it. Uh, I realized that, uh, very quickly that Lee was very smart. He wasn't a big talker, but when he asked you something, uh, you could just tell that there was thought behind it and the man had intelligence. And to tell you a little side story, one day he was uh, talking and the guys were laughing and he used a sentence and there's a word in the sentence I didn't understand. I said, well, well what is that? What does that mean? Well, being a, a school book father, we had a lot of dictionaries. <laughs> so I go over to the... Uh, Bins and I pull out a dictionary and I find the word and I was reading the definition and then I applied the definition of the word to the sentence he used and behold he caught me reading in the dictionary 
He says, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm looking up that word you used in a sentence. I said, I wasn't familiar about, and I didn't know exactly what it meant, but I said, now I understand. And then that's when he come back to me, and about this, we stand about this far apart, our faces. He says, you're very different. I said, I don't know about that. He said, well, you don't make fun of me. He said, you try to understand you're nice, you're kind. And I said, well, thank you. But uh, no, he didn't get along very well with the, uh, the uh, other employees. Uh, there wasn't any hard feelings that, that he, just didn't, he just didn't fit in. Now, it wasn't long before you started giving Oswald a ride to Irving. Now, Oswald and his wife were, were separated at that time. She was living with Ruth Payne and Irving. Oswald had a rooming house over here on Beckley in Oak Cliff. So on these trips, going to and from, on leaving Friday, bringing him back on Monday, what would you guys talk about? Well, the number one thing that I could get Lee to talk about was uh, his child. Marina, uh, they had one child, and Marina was uh, pregnant with her second child. Uh, and I could get more out of him talking about his, his daughter. Uh, he didn't, we didn't talk about sports or what the latest uh, uh, number one hit on the uh, radio was, nothing like that. It was strictly business. And contrary to some of the accounts that are out there, you never took Lee to a rifle range or went out to eat with him or anything like that? That is true. We never, when we would, uh, when we would be coming home on Friday afternoon, and it still is in America, a lot of times when guys work together, sometimes they'll stop off and they'll have a burger and a beer, and they'll talk about what went on that week or what they're maybe going on next week. We never did any of that. And as far as the rifle range, um, we never went to a rifle range. The only way, the only place we would go together was out to Irving and then back to uh, Texas School Books and Dallas here. Mm -hmm. The same building you're in here. Now, Lee famously deviated from his typical Friday, Monday routine and asked you for a ride on Thursday, November 21st, so he could spend the night in Irving. Yes, th that is correct. He did. He came up to me during the day, uh, I think it was sometime a little after lunch, and he said, can I ride home with you today? I said, sure. I said, I told you, you could ride any day. Well, a short time later, I was reading, uh, I was filling an order, and I looked at the date on the invoice. I said, today's not Friday. It's Thursday. So the next time I ran into him a little while later, I said, I said, hey, I said, are you aware that this, this is not Friday? This is Thursday. He said, yes. He said, I know that. And he said, you told me I could always ride out with you when I needed to ride. And I said, that is correct. So um, he said that uh, he'd be riding home with me that, that afternoon. And the reason he wanted to ride home, he told me that uh, Marina had made him some curtains uh, for his um, room at the rooming house. And that he was going out to uh, Irving to get some curtain rods that Miss Payne had. So I said, okay. I didn't think anything about it. Now, I never had been to the rooming house. I did not know what I'm fixing to tell you. He already had curtains in his room, but I did not know that. The curtain rods, of course, are very important to the next part of the story. The next morning, you and your sister, Lenny Mae Randall, observe Lee with a package. Tell me about that package. Well, my sister was at the uh, kitchen sink, and she was fixing my lunch. I took my lunch every day. And so she looked up, and she saw Lee walking across the street, and he had a package with him. Well, he, go, he crosses the street puts a package on the passenger side in the back uh, seat of my car, which is a four-door Chevy. And uh, then he comes around and he looks in the window. So my three little nieces and I were eating breakfast. My mother was there. 
she looks up and she says, Lee looking in the window. Well, she was startled. And she says, who's that man looking in the window? Being a typical teenage kid, I said, where? Because we had more than one window in that part of the house, the uh, kitchen in the den area. So she says, over at the sink. Well, I looked and there he was, looking in the window. So I get up from the table, I go to the back door, it opens into a, a double carport, and so he hears me open the door, he comes around, and so I said, well, you know, I'm running a few minutes late, I'm just finishing my breakfast. So I said, uh, would you like to come in and have a cup of coffee? He said, no, he said, I'll just wait for you here. And so I go back to the table, I finish eating my breakfast, Go brush my teeth, and by the time I do that, my sister has finished my lunch. So I walk through the kitchen den area, I pick up my lunch, and I go out the door, and there he is, out standing right where he was, uh, on the carport. And so we walked together to the, the car, which was parked on the outside of the double carport. Uh, and so as we're Getting in the car and sitting down, I'm looking at him, but I catch up in the back seat, and I asked him, I said, Lee, what's in the package? He says, don't you remember? We talked about that yesterday. It's curtain rod. I said, okay. Well, I didn't think anything about the curtain rods. We're going to come back to those a little bit later in the story, but I want to show folks where you parked that day. So this is a Warren Commission exhibit showing a map of this area which has changed quite a bit uh, since 1963 and, and you parked quite a distance away. We let you park a lot closer to the building today than you did in 1963. Oh, absolutely. Um, but so you, you stayed in the car, Lee walked in, so you got to see Lee walking in with this package. Now tell us how he was carrying this package. Okay. Uh, when we first get to the parking lot, uh, I'm trying to charge the battery on my car, make sure it have enough to start in the evening. Uh, so he gets out of the car. He opens the back door on the passenger side. He takes out the package. And he stands there a minute, and then he realizes what I'm doing. So he starts to walk off. How did he, how did he carry the package? He put one end under his uh, armpit and the other one in his right hand. Uh, and so he, he walked uh, toward the building that uh, we'd be working in. I never did catch up with him. Uh, all other times we walked together, but this morning was different. Just like earlier, uh, he walked down and put the package in the back seat of my car. I used to catch him walking down the sidewalk to the house, or I'd stop in front of the house and blow on the horn. Uh, but uh, we had to walk a, a good 250 uh, yards, meters to work because the where I parked was outside in a fenced-in area outside of the other warehouse we had, which was a state warehouse. Um, so... Um, this was an extraordinary day because you knew from the uh, map published in the newspaper that the president was going to be passing right by your building that day, right on your lunch break, in fact, so you would have the chance to see the president. Well, the way I, that that morning when, um, on Friday morning when we started work, we had a young teenage boy. Uh, I was more interested in listening to the radio and, uh, the, and the news and so forth, but I did not know at that time, Friday morning, that the uh, uh, presidential motorcade was going to be passing out front of this building. The way I learned about that was that we had an employee that worked there, and most of the people, by the way, the way they uh, got to their employment was they used the bus service. Uh, Mr. Shelley and uh, Mr. Truly and Mr. Kaysen, they all had a uh, carport out here west of the side of the buildings they parked on. 
and I was the only one that um, had a car that I lived far enough away that I had to drive to park in the, the parking lot where I, I parked. Um, but getting about later that morning after we got to work, as I said, uh, Junior Jarman, he always bought a newspaper every day. And Junior uh, kept up on what was going on around Dallas and in Dallas. And so when I was getting my orders out of the box, close to where Junior worked, he says, he said, Wesley, he said, come over, I want to show you something. I said, Junior, I picked up a big stack of orders, and our goal was to ship everything that came off the printer that day. And uh, so we had a small crew, so we worked well together, but you had to bust your butt. It wasn't no, it wasn't no standing around talking and while gagging through the day. You had to get the books pulled uh, correctly, and uh, but after about the second or third time I was there at the box, he says, "Wesley, I want to show you something." So I, but Tony's voice, I, I knew something was very important to Junior Jarman. So I walk around there. And there he has the newspaper, and it shows the route of the presidential motorcade. He said, look here. He says, it's going to come right by the building. I said, golly, I said, that's something. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you, I think starting as early as Wednesday, we had two newspapers, the Dallas Times-Herald and the Dallas Morning News. The Dallas Times-Herald has gone out of business. The Dallas Morning News is still in business. But... They both uh, printed proposed uh, routes for the presidential motorcade. Uh, which paper Junior was showing me in, I don't know. I do know that most of the time he bought a Dallas Morning News. Uh, but the paper he was showing me the diagram on, and I've been asked, I don't, I don't know whether it was the Dallas Morning News or Dallas Times Herald. Uh, I was very busy. I had a lot of work to do that day. So, and he asked me, he says, are we going to get to go out and watch the parade? I looked up, I said, Junior, I don't know. I just work here. <laughs> I said, I'm not anybody's supervisor or boss. I said, I don't make those decisions. Well, he asked me a couple other times, and I finally I said, okay, Junior, I'm going to find out. So I went, so I passed by Mr. Shelley, and I said, I have a question for you. Uh, Mr. Shelley said, uh, and I asked Mr. Shelley, I said, are we going to get to go out and watch the presidential motorcade, which will be passing right in front of this building where we are? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I said, we'd like to know. So he goes to Mr. Truly, and Mr. Truly goes to Mr. Kaysen, by the way, regardless of what publisher he worked for him. Mr. Kaysen was everybody's boss in this building. Uh, so he came back sometime later, before lunch, and I was told to, to tell Junior that we was going to be able to go out and see the, uh, watch the presidential motorcade if one so desired. So I told him, so everybody was happy. And uh, so getting close to lunch, everybody people began to uh, congregate and form out in front of the building. Some were on the steps. The that's, steps were pretty full. That's what we're looking at right now from the inside of the building, looking out towards Dealey Plaza. And you were right there at the top of those steps during the yes. assassination. Yes. It, in fact, in this next image, this is from the uh, home movie shot by young Tina Towner. Buell, you're in this picture in the darkness of the doorway of the school book depository, and you can see President and Mrs. Kennedy as they are making that fateful turn uh, from Houston onto Elm Street. Buell, uh, just give us a sense of, of those moments when you heard the shots fired in the plaza. Well, uh, when I first heard the, the uh, first shot, now let me tell you, for the ones of you not familiar with this area, uh, this area here, Dealey Plaza, it's, uh, it's closed on three sides and open on one. And then November, December, with the wind swirling, you have a lot of the same uh, effects of like you're in a canyon. 
and you holler and you hear the ricochet, your voice ricocheting back and forth. Um, but before the uh, motorcade turned to turn on to Elm Street there, it was being led by a group of motorcycle policemen. Uh, and they were cutting their motorcycles on and off, making them backfire. backfire. Um, and the first shot I heard, I thought was simply someone cutting their bike off and making it backfire. But then a short time later, then there was two more. By that time, being a boy growing up in the country and hunting, I knew the sound, it's a different sound between a motorcycle backfire and, a, and a actual someone firing a, a, some type of a weapon. Uh, so I realized then what I was hearing was uh, actual shots. Um, now, different people have said there was more than three shots. Um, that's all I heard, but was the sound ricocheting off the building, that's why some people say there's five, six shots or more. Uh, I guess according to where they were standing. And so after the shooting takes place, you witness something which you did not talk about for more than 50 years. It was right in the aftermath of the assassination, and the first time you shared this story was in your book. It's one of several stories that you've never shared before. So you saw somebody with a rifle outside of this building. That briefly, is correct. Briefly tell us that. Well, Mr. Shelley and Billy had gone down uh, toward the triple underpass to try to find out what actually had happened. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of people that day on the sidewalk. The sidewalk out here is pretty wide, but I mean, they were just like, uh, uh, excuse the expression, like sardines in a can. There wasn't any room. I mean, if someone passed out, they would never, they would never hit the concrete. There's so many people. Uh, so they had gone down to see if they could find out what actually was going on. Well, I stood on the steps uh, for a few uh, short time, and then I said, well, I'm going to go see if I can find Billy and Mr. Shelley. So I go start down that way, and out in front of this building here used to be angle parking. And... Uh, so I was somewhere down in the area of the angle park in there, and I was walking along, and I looked up, and there was a man with a rifle. Uh, I was terrified. Stop and think, what actually happened there 58 years ago today? That's a crime of the century. It's never been solved. So I saw this man. This man was not a policeman. He was not a detective. He, if you could have seen the type of clothing he, wore, he was wearing that day, this guy was a professional, all the way down to his shoes. His shoes probably cost several hundred dollars. And back then, in 1963, not many people wore shoes or, or in that price range. His, his clothing was such much greater quality. I talked to my friend Jim Lavelle about that. Jim Lavelle had a, a new suit he wore uh, the day they transported, was transporting Lee from the uh, city jail headquarters down to the uh, city jail here. That suit is downstairs on display on the uh, sixth floor right now. Yes. Uh, so he and I talked about the clothing and I told him, I said, you know, that's something that I always admired was clothing, uh, and but the the attire this man wore, starting off with his fedora. You know, telling what that hat cost. His clothing, he was immaculate. This guy was a pro. He looked at me, and the look he had on his face was a cold look. He wasn't scared. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I was so scared, he probably thought I couldn't remember my name. And at the time, I probably couldn't have. But he puts the rifle in the back seat of his car. He's parked out at the angle parking. And he closes the trunk and goes 
to open the door on his car. I turn around and I walk slowly back toward the front entrance of the Texas School Book Depository. I was so scared. What I had witnessed that day and that time, I did see it. But if you had asked me 10 minutes later, I would have told you I didn't see anything. It was locked in my mind. I've read about this where people have witnessed things that were so frightening to them, it just locked into their mind. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, and I walked back slowly toward the, the front uh, steps of the Texas School Book Depository, but I didn't go up the steps. I went to the corner of uh, Houston and Elm Street. And there was a couple of people there, and we started to talk about what was going on. And then I turned to my left. And walking, he comes off the dock, the loading dock here this building, was Lee Harvey Oswald. Walked along the side of the building, very patiently, not in a hurry. Uh, and I thought he was going to walk all the way up to where I was, but he did not. He stopped probably 10 feet or so before, and he went diagonally across, got in the crosswalk, crossed Houston, and once he crossed Houston Street, then he crossed Elm Street, and halfway across Elm, somebody said something to me, and I turned to see who was talking to me, because I did not recognize the voice. And when I looked back, I had lost Lee in the crowd. Now, these are obviously some very extraordinary memories, and you're well aware that in your affidavit from that day, your Warren Commission testimony, you discuss seeing the parade pass and then immediately going downstairs to the basement to have your lunch. So, I mean, these additions to your story have come under some scrutiny by, by assassination researchers. You mentioned you were scared, and I know you write about this in some detail in the book, but, I mean, give us a sense. You were afraid for yourself and afraid for your family to reveal some of this information? Yes, I was, but what I told you, what I'd witnessed, when I was, uh, later that day, uh, that afternoon, matter of fact, not long after we were released, I was picked up by the Dallas Police Department, and I was uh, interrogated for many hours. We have some footage of you. I'll, I'll put it on the screen here. You can go ahead and keep talking because it's silent, but uh, this is you'll see the camera will freeze on Buell for a moment, 19-year-old Buell Wesley Frazier. Go ahead and tell us about your experience with Will Fritz and the detectives. Okay. After many hours of, uh, of interrogation, and there's... It would be by uh, two uh, Dallas detectives. The first was Detective uh, Rose and Detective Stovall. They were the two detectives that came out to Irving and arrested me uh, in the hospital where I was there said, uh, checking on my stepfather for my mother. Uh, they, they started the interrogation. And it went on quite lengthy. Uh, and then they would leave another team would come in and the same questions over and over. This went on for hours. And uh, so after several uh, two team of detectives uh, questioned me and interrogated me, uh, I, my little short man walked in uh, and he had with him a typed confession. And he had a pen, and he puts it down in front of me. He said, sign that. Well, I pick up the pen, and I start, I pick up the pen, and then I start to read. And I was always told, I was always told, you don't sign anything until you read it. And so when I started to read it, remember now, Will Fritz was standing right here beside me like I'm sitting in this chair. He was standing there. And I said, I'm not signing that. I said, this is ridiculous. Well, he drew his hand up to strike me, hit me. And I put my arm up to block. And I told him, I said, you know, there's policemen outside that door. And I said, before they get in there, 
you're not going to have a hell of a fight, and I'm going to get some good licks in on you, because then I was angry. Up to then, I was just trying to help the Dallas police fight. But, but when he comes in and accuses me of doing, of being part of a crime that I never imagined in my mind of doing, would never do anything like that, that really made me angry. So and this is this is Captain Will Fritz of, of the Dallas Police Department in charge of the investigation, and he brings you a, a confession saying that you were part of a conspiracy with Lee Oswald to kill the president? That is correct. Um, and so he snatches up the paper and a pen and stomps out of the room, and I've never seen, I never did see him again. The thing is, like I tell people, uh, I'm sure he did some good work for the Dallas Police Department, but sometimes when a person works in that capacity, they begin to change, and they don't even know it. They become like the people they hunt, and which is sad. And uh, you can go back and check the convictions that he, uh, he got while being in the position of uh, Captain uh, Will Fritz, head of the Homicide Department. There's a place south of here called Huntsville, Texas, about 200 miles. And that is, uh, that is where the uh, Department of Corrections are. Here a few years ago, less than five years ago, they found people down there that had been convicted by Will Fritz and sentenced to prison 38, 42 years, and somebody goes into the property room and starts looking into some of these cases. Well, they were in the evidence box. They found things in the evidence box. If he had been presented at the trial, their trial, they never would have been convicted in the first place. So I asked myself, how can you give someone back 38, 42 years of their life? You can't. And that's why, and I was served on a couple of juries, I can't convict someone of anything unless I'm 100% sure they're guilty. And I think that's the way it should be. I think uh, the judicial system in this country is not what our founding forefathers designed it to be. At that, when it was first designed, you were innocent until proven guilty. Nowadays, in 2021, you're guilty until proven innocent. And that is not the correct way the judicial system should be. Um, it was certainly a hard thing for you as a 19-year-old uh, to experience at that time. And I know that you've mentioned that that was really the day you grew up, November 22nd, 1963. That is true. I want to ask you about the picture on the screen here. You mentioned earlier the package. Lee told you they were curtain rods. You were very specific that Oswald had it cupped in his palm, tucked in his arm. You told the Warren Commission it was about two feet, the length of the package. Yeah. Of course, the Warren Commission concluded that it was the Manneker Kirkano rifle that rode in your car that morning to the uh, Texas School Book Depository, but you don't believe that. There's a discrepancy as far as the length of the weapon. And the rifle is disassembled, 35 inches versus the two feet that you remember. How do you, I know you've been asked this many, many times, you write about it in the book, but how do you reconcile the difference, the, the considerable difference in length between the rifle disassembled and the package that you and your sister both observed that day? Well, as you just said, uh, the package on the back seat of my car I don't know what was in those because I never looked. And why would I? Because Lee never lied to me that I knew of. I was always taught you could trust someone until they proved to you that you could not. Well, he never did that. So I had no, he told me it was curtain rods. It's curtain rods, as far as I consider. Uh, but the, the length of the package, you can see 
that there is the link that you could have a fully assembled rifle in. Uh, I've been asked, well, how did, if he didn't carry the rifle that morning, how did it get into the Texas School Book Project? Answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. It appeared there, and you know, if it appeared there, someone had to bring it. Uh, when we were leaving after, and if we weren't working overtime, uh, if the freight lines had not picked up, uh, the freight lines would back up to the dock, go up, and check their freight, take and sign their bills, and go put them in the box on Billy Lovelady's desk, because Billy Lovelady uh, did the receiving and the shipping. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that anyone could walk up on the dock, get the freight elevators, go up, and could have taken the rifle up to the sixth floor. Did that happen? Evidently, he got up there somewhere. He didn't get up there by himself. Now, who took the rifle up there? I don't know. Uh, maybe someday we'll know. Uh, with all the technology uh, that we're having and it's growing by leaps and bounds, I think there's, I think there's somebody that's going to be extremely smart, and they're going to put a piece here and a piece there, and it's going they're going to put the puzzle together. Now, here's the thing. Will the American people in the world accept what they're finding? And I have a version of where I th think this is going to happen. Uh, sometimes when you have estate sales, uh, people buy different things. Uh, and this, my theory is, is that uh, someone has bought someone's library. And people are in there boxing up the books. And somebody tries to pick up more books than they can handle, and one falls on the floor. Well, they reach around, and they pick it up, and it's open. And if you stop and think about it, every book that you purchase, if you look in the back of that book, there's blank pages. Well, then on this particular book, I think there's going to be there's going to be something on the page. It's not going to be blank. I have believed from the very day one that I think this terrible tragedy was committed by a conspiracy. Now, some people believe that, some don't. But getting back to the book, in the back of that book is going to be written all the key players that formed this conspiracy and why they work together to assassinate this man. Uh, it's, it's widely known that uh, John Kennedy and his uh, brother Bobby, they wanted to change how things were done in Washington, D.C. And some of these people that they wanted to change and take out of power didn't like that theory at all. Now, are there names on that list? I don't know. Could be. Because I haven't seen the book. And I don't know where it will happen in my lifetime. But here's the thing. I think when you read that, if that is a possibility and it does happen, after reading it, people are going to ask, is this really what happened on November the 22nd, 1963? And here's another thing. If you could go ahead and pass your question cards to the end of your rows, as soon as he's finished here, we'll start going through audience questions until the moment of silence. OK. And here's another thing. Uh, it's, um, it'd be interesting to see. I don't know if that ever happened. But uh, the thing is that what is a big concern of mine is why our government, they've had 58 years to delete, shred, and do away. Why, why, why are they holding documents that they don't want America and the rest of the world to see? What's in that so important? I think it's more than most people want to read. 
And I think after reading that, I think the pieces to the puzzle will come together. You won't have to worry about finding a book to read. It'll be all there. Who was actually guilty of assassinating our president? Well, speaking of a different book, we have a picture on the screen here of the book you have just written, Steering Truth. It's available signed down in our bookstore today. Buell, uh, briefly, because I'm going to go through these questions here, but briefly tell us why you waited almost 60 years to write your autobiography. Well, one thing, I was very scared. I was very scared for not only for myself, but my family. Uh, and I was afraid that that would, uh, that would cause a lot of problems. And I decided to wait, and one day my son calls me on the phone, and he asked me, he says, Dad, he says, when are you going to write your story? He said, you're capable of speaking for yourself. People have been trying to tell your story and speak for you for over 50 years. He said, don't you think it's time that you talk to America and the rest of the world and tell them your, what your thoughts were about this terrible tragedy that happened? We've got several questions here. So this is about the story you mentioned earlier about seeing the man with the rifle immediately after the assassination. The question is, did you tell any family or friends at that time about the man putting the, the rifle into his car? Uh, no. You kept it completely to yourself? The only body I could have talked to about that would be my sister. And sometime um, she passed away in December the 20th, 2012. And all the time since 1968, we only talked three or four times, and we was always by herself. Because our thoughts was very important to us, and we didn't want somebody to hear it and go off calling and telling somebody something. So we kept it to ourselves. We thought that was the best way. Our children didn't even know. Her children didn't know. They were never around. Just she and I sitting and talking about that fateful day. Another question, uh, again, about that incident that you witnessed down there. Where did the car go? You said the car left, but where did it go? All right. The, uh, the car backed out and the little street in front of the building here called the Elm Street Extension. Mm -hmm. uh, it drove away, and I don't know where the car. He, he drove you don't remember if it turned on Houston or went around to no, Elm? No, okay. no. I was so scared, I, I just couldn't look. Okay. Were there other people around? I mean, this for, for someone to have this rifle out in the open where you were able to just see him, was there anyone else around who was witnessing the same thing, to your knowledge? No. Okay. And uh, my wife asked me, she says, Could, didn't someone else see him? And my answer is, I don't know. All I know, it was just he and I there at the car. When you were witnessing the shooting, up standing on the top of the steps of the School Book Depository, were you surrounded only by depository employees, meaning did you know everybody that was up there watching the parade with you? No, I did not know everyone because uh, the only people I knew that worked up in the uh, office uh, there for the different publishers is someone that I had contact with uh, talking about an order. Now, could there have been someone that did uh, work there in the uh, work in this building, Texas School Book Deposit? There could have been. I don't know. Now, of course, there's been a theory over the years that Oswald was out there with you, standing at the top of those steps. You mentioned seeing Oswald coming down from the loading dock after the assassination which is, uh, doesn't fit with the official explanation of Oswald coming out the front entrance. But, I mean, just to be absolutely clear, since you were right there 58 years ago, you have no memory whatsoever of seeing Oswald anywhere in that area in the front part of the building where the entrance was at the time of the shooting. That is correct. I did, I did not see him. Now the, uh, now, the person in the picture there of the front steps of the Texas School Book Depository, down on the very bottom, looks like he's holding up the wall, is a man named Billy Lovelady. Mm. And if some people say that is Oswald, 
If you put Billy Lovelady standing beside Lee Oswald, there's no comparison. The only thing they have that compare, could be compared is they both had a high forehead. Did you ever talk to Lee about his time in Russia or his service in the Marine Corps? No. Um, Lee wasn't a talking person, as I said before. And um, I learned a lot of things about him afterwards. But as far as talking to him about his, what he did in Russia or in the Marine Corps, we never talked about anything like that. This is a little bit of a personal question, but it's so interesting I want to ask it. Do you relive that day in your mind every day, and did people treat you differently after the assassination? Um, I do go back to that time and that day a lot. Um, you might say I'm a time traveler. I, I'm, I'm going back, I'm looking and trying to figure out things and asking myself, how did you miss that? The first thing, I didn't know a terrible tragedy like that was going to happen. Um, but um, I do think of it often. Um, my wife will tell you sometimes, uh, she can kind of tell when I'm somewhere else. It's a... It's, it's a memory that I wish that I had never been a part of. But um, we can't always choose what happens to us in a day. And you never know what a day is going to bring. Um, some people, and I tell people sometimes what makes tomorrow, Tuesday, so interesting to me is what will tomorrow bring? Yes. Um, what we haven't talked about is that since that day, it's been a long road for me. Um, I've lost a lot of jobs because of this. Uh, You'd be working somewhere and, and they, everything is rosy and then one day they call you in office and, and for one various reason or another, well, we're going to let you go. And one place I worked at, uh, they told me, I asked them, I said, well, why are you firing me? Because I'd been through this many times before that. And they said, because you lied on your application. And I said, well, what did I lie about on my application? And they said, you lied on your application because you said you had never been convicted of a felony. And I looked the man in the eye and I said, I've never been convicted of anything. I said, question? Yes, many times but never a conviction. Well, that didn't change anything. I, he told me to get my stuff and get out the door. And since then, I changed my thinking about the type of job to work, work for. At that time, I, I worked for a company. I wore a suit and a tie. And I was supposed to be the next manager of the next store open. That's how much they thought of me and my ability. And you can see when one thought is in the toilet and flushed down the drain. So I said to myself, why put yourself through that? It always ends in disappointment. So I started applying for jobs that where they didn't care where I was yesterday. All they care about is what are you doing for me now? And when you do, when you apply for those type of jobs, you take a lot less money. And we all know that 
uh, and they take the man and the woman, both according to how many children they have, try to make and support your family. Well, that was my goal, to support my family and put my thoughts aside. Just do what I have to do to get through the day. Uh, would part of the problem be that authors or researchers or investigators even would contact you at your current place of work and somehow make you seem suspicious? Uh, well, back in 1977, uh, they sent a team here to Dallas. They were still trying to convict me of what happened in 1963. This would have been the House Select Committee on Assassinations? Yes. And they found out that I was totally innocent, just like uh, what the two detectives told uh, Captain Fritz. But the thing that I have learned over my lifetime is that you can't tell someone what they don't want to know. If they have in their mind that, that you're guilty of something or, or, or you're not a nice person, that's, that's the way they're always going to look at you. But here's the catch. You have to, you can't control them, but you can control yourself and who you are. And that's what I do every day. We're getting close to, uh, to 1230, but I do want to ask you something. We kind of jumped over a part of the story. During that encounter with the detectives leading into your interrogation or uh, circumstances with Will Fritz, when did you find out along the way that Lee was the man that had been arrested? And, and how did that make you feel that the man you drove to work that day was now under arrest for the murder of the president? Well I, well, I found out about that when they arrested me out at the hospital in Irving, Texas. And I asked them, I said, and they said, we're arresting you. And I said, what are you arresting me for? They said, for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I said, I have nothing to do with that. And they, and they said, oh, you know the man who did it. I'd like to close on, if you go out to the front of this building, there's a sign about, the AB, about like that, over on the corner. It says that he is the alleged assassin. When you really look into it, Lee was never convicted of anything because he never went before a judge and a jury. And some people may find that strange because you can read in a lot of uh, books out there. I think there's been over 3,000 books written about this assassination. And a lot of them tell you very strongly that he is the assassin. Well, were they there? No. Where did they get their facts? Hearsay. I think we need to be interested in this, but leave it as it is. He is the alleged assassin. We, we, didn't, we don't know whether he did that or not. I don't think he did because of the uh, the way uh, he conducted himself when I worked with him, he's always nice and polite to me. Uh, and it's every Friday, it wasn't the last day of school for the week. It's the day that I brought Lee out to Irving. And all the kids in the neighborhood would come up to Miss Payne's house and play around that big oak tree, by the way, which stands there today. And I was over there a little over a week ago uh, with two gentlemen, and I said, have you ever asked yourself if this tree could really talk, what stories it could tell you about Lee Oswald and the, and the time he spent with the children playing around that oak tree? My little nieces just thought, they, they thought he was so fun. And he was so kind to them. Uh, Thank you very much. And please join me in thanking this extraordinary gentleman, Buell Frazier, for sharing this story today. Thank you.